Hello and welcome back to Viper Bites continued series here looking at the training camps ahead of the 2022 season here and now we are heading to the NFC South. We've got the Falcons, we got the Bucks, we've got the Panthers and we have the Saints and we've also got a promo code to fantasypoints.com. Enter Vipers22 and get 10% off that subscription today and make sure you are subscribed to the Vipers network right here. Hit that like, hit that subscribe, and if you're listening to us on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, take a second, rate and review us. Greatly appreciated. Now let's dive right into this. Let's head to the Atlanta Falcons right off the get-go, and let's talk about a little bit of changes taking place in that quarterback room for the Falcons. Starting with Matt Ryan. He was dealt after 14 seasons with the Falcons, more than 220 games in which he attempted 8,000-plus passes, nearly 60,000 yards, all because Atlanta got cute, decided to flirt with the whole Deshaun Watson thing, got their hand, caught in the cookie jar, and now he went to the Browns to dance instead. So we talked about getting your hand caught in that cookie jar. They needed a bridge quarterback. So they went out there and they signed themselves Marcus Mariota. Luckily for them, Desmond Ritter, he kind of fell in the drought right into their laps. Atlanta found themselves having that good fortune, having that Bearcat fall to him in round three of this year's draft. And he is going to come in there and he's going to compete right off the get-go with Marcus Mariota for that QB1 position there for the Falcons. Mariota, he hasn't started since 2019. And Ritter is the rookie coming in, okay? Who had, he had a little bit of some accuracy mishaps back in college and you know, the early advantage that's going to go with Marcus Mariota, who has a little bit of history with Falcons head coach Arthur Smith back in Tennessee. But then again, it was kind of Arthur Smith kind of saw that Marcus Mariota was kind of out of there, brought in, ushered in the whole Ryan Tannehill phase. So who knows what Arthur Smith's going to do with Marcus Mariota? We know he likes to run the ball. Mariota can run the ball. So can Ritter. Early advantage, Mariota in camp. Don't be surprised if Ritter comes in. He takes over for Mariota after two, three weeks, especially if the Falcons struggle here a little bit. Now, when your best option at running back is a converted wide receiver slash special teamer, it means the depth chart is probably pretty wide open here. Credit where credit is due. Cordell Patterson there averaged four yards per carry last season. He had six rushing touchdowns. He accumulated 618 rushing yards. Then again, Mike Davis, Quadri Olsen, and Wayne Gallman were his primary competition. Now, as far as Olsen, he is still in toll. However, he will be battling here on this roster for a spot here as we get closer. And I don't think Olsen's position here on this roster is completely secure. Arthur Smith, he wants to run the ball. He had Derrick Henry in Tennessee. This is going to have to be done by committee unless Damian Williams and or rookie Tyler Algier can carve themselves out a role or a more prominent role away from Cordero Patterson here earlier than later. Now, I like Patterson to continue to be bounced around, create mismatches all over the field, and Williams and Algier just kind of split carries until one starts to prove themselves more valuable than the other, with the Falcons kind of going with that hot hand approach there in the south. Now, the wide receiver position, unlike the running back position, the Falcons, they do have a blue chip prospect there in Drake London. Brian Edwards... He's there as well, but the eighth overall selection of the Falcons, they have high hopes for this rookie when it comes to camp, and he is the unquestioned number one wide receiver on this team. Now, behind London, you have the aforementioned there, Brian Edwards, who, along with a seventh-round pick, was acquired from the Raiders in a deal that I saw a fifth-round pick in 2023 going the other direction. Now, let's try and figure out how this rest of this depth chart is going to sort itself out behind London, behind Edwards. You have Olamai Zacchaeus there. Looks like the early favorite to kind of secure those early reps in the slot over Demir Bird. Auden Tate and Frank Tarby, they'll be competing with one another in four wide receiver sets with Geronimo Allison and Cardero Hodge hoping to make the most of an opportunity if there are injuries in camp. Now, we know, okay, let me backphrase this. Maybe the top wide receiver is not really a wide receiver for the Falcons. Kyle Pitts, he isn't a tight end. He's a wide receiver. I don't care how you want to talk about it. Pitts lined up out wide or in the slot a whopping 79% of his routes last season. In fact, if I'm Atlanta, I'm playing Pitts in the slot 99% of the time along with London, along with Edwards, and motioning Patterson out of the field backfield every once in a while to create some of those mismatches. 
The only other notable tight end who's an actual tight end on this roster is Anthony Ferkster. And you know what? Hey, I was a big Ferkster guy in Tennessee last year when Jonah Smith went. He burnt me, so I don't care anymore. Ferkster, you're pretty much dead to me when it comes to fantasy. Now, on defense, some rumors have been floated out there that Deion Jones is a potential cut candidate ahead of camp in a move. It'll probably save the Falcons a few dollars there. If rumors turn out to be true, that would open the door for Mikel Walker to play alongside free agent acquisition Rashawn Evans in the middle of that Falcons defense. Now, let's talk about the Carolina Panthers here. It's not a battle yet, but Sam Donald sees ghosts in front of him, Matt Carroll behind him, and potentially even Baker Mayfield. Who knows how this quarterback position is going to shape out here ahead of camp. Darnell, he will have a chance to bounce back in 2022, but make no mistake, he's going to be on a short leash. It's just the way it's going to be. Unfortunately for Donald, the schedule isn't exactly in his favor, especially early on with games against the Browns, the Giants, the Saints, the Cardinals, the Rams, and the Bucks. Of those first seven games, five of those teams, they finished with top 10 defenses last year. Now, that's yes, yes, that was last year, but hey, it's not easy sledding for the young guy. Heck, who knows? Maybe even Cam Newton comes back. Crazier things, they have happened. A running back in four of five games in which McCaffrey was healthy and did not leave early, he finished as a top four running back the other game he was still a top 15 option going even further back since 2019 McCaffrey has been a top 15 option in 23 of 24 games in which he was healthy keyword in which he was healthy now see the trend healthy McCaffrey good hurt McCaffrey bad battling it out behind McCaffrey is going to be Chuba Hubbard who filled in last season with 612 rushing yards averaging 3.6 yards per carry and Dante Foreman Foreman last season posted three games of over 100 yards for the Titans after they had lost Derrick Henry. So we know Foreman, he can come in there. This is going to be an interesting battle between Hubbard and Foreman to see who could secure that RB2 status there in Carolina. At wide receiver, DJ Moore, Robbie Anderson looked to be the one-two punch for the Panthers in the receiving game. That is unless Robbie Anderson doesn't retire or Baker Mayfield comes over to Carolina because there's some text messages or something. I don't know, but hey, even with everything going wrong for the Panthers offense last season, Moore still finished 23rd in yards per route run. Even Anderson is questionable as a wide receiver too. Was he that bad last year or was the QB play even worse than we had thought? Terrace Marshall, he'll be the one to watch here in camp. Can he push for a spot opposite of Moore or will he drop behind Rashad Hollywood Higgins? on the team's depth chart, which could also factor into if Baker Mayfield comes over and Higgins with the connection. I don't, you know what? Let's not get into that. Let's talk about the tight ends here right now. Tommy Treble, Ian Thomas, Stephen Sullivan. Was he the dude that played in Monsters, Inc.? Stephen Sullivan? No, you know what? We're not going to talk about cartoons here right now. These are the tight ends heading into camp right now. Tommy Treble and Thomas. They had combined for 38 receptions, 75 targets, and 369 yards, with neither of them having much of an edge last season. So I like Treble to come out somehow, some way, as the number one guy here. A slight nudge to him after camp is all said and done. Carolina on defense. We've watched them retool and rebuild this defense the last few years in the draft. On this defense, on paper, there is talent. You tear gross motos there. Derek Brown, Matt Ioannidis, Brian Burns up front, Shaq Thompson, Corey Littleton. They're in that middle level there. And in the secondary, that includes Dante Jackson, C.J. Henderson, Jeremy Chin, Xavier Woods, and J.C. Horn. Problem is, after that, there is very little depth. Now, who will step up in camp? That is to be seen. When the Saints, they come marching into camp, it will be with Jamison Winston, probably under center. And you know what? Jameis Winston, is he basically turning himself into the modern-day Trent Dilfer? Okay, all kidding aside, Jameson Winston, he is returning in 2022 after only playing seven games last season. And in those seven contests, he attempted about 25 passes per game. We all know from his limited time as a star that Ian Book is certainly not an option behind Winston. So the Saints, hey, they went out there. They got themselves some insurance there. A little red rifle policy there. Andy Dalton will pass throwing to tight end Taysom Hill. Yeah, maybe he's still in mix. Maybe not. I don't know. If you can make sense of what, what Taysom Hill actually is, you're a better man than I am. Battling it out for RB2 supremacy in the Saints backfield. 
will be important considering we are not 100% certain in regards to Alvin Kamara's legal situation. That will most likely result in a suspension. Now, we're hearing six games kind of come out of reports here, back and forth a little bit here. So behind Kamara, you have the wily old vet, Mark Ingram. If you're in best ball right now, he is a guy you need to be targeting, guaranteed late in those drafts. Tony Jones is there. And one of my favorites, Baylor running back, Abram Smith. So don't forget that name here ahead of your drafts or fantasy managers. As mentioned, Winston is trying to get himself right after surgery on the knee, which means he's going to have an early emphasis on that run game. Establishing that ground game early sets Kamara or Ingram or whoever that's going to be up to finish very nicely. Now, Ingram has never finished lower than eighth in terms of fantasy points per game throughout his career. Looking at that running back uh, battle closely, Ingram averaged 3.8 yards per carry on 68 attempts last year, which is two fewer carries than Taysom Hill recorded. Come on, man. Now, while Jones wasn't statistically worse, averaging 2.6 yards per attempt, it's that bad, okay? So Ingram he looks like to be the good guy here to go for for the Saints here. Enter former Baylor Bear Abram Smith, who last season averaged 6.2 yards per carry on his way to 1,601 rushing yards. <laughs> so there's definitely a guy who can make a little bit of noise here in camp. Training camp battle number one, as far as the wide receiver positions goes to, Michael Thomas versus himself, right? Seriously, how long does it take to recover from anything these days? Cam Akers, he basically came back in like, what, eight weeks? I don't know what the actual number is. It was a little bit longer, but he still came back the same season which he ruptured his Achilles tendon. When was the last time some player sat out two full seasons and came back and played at a Pro Bowl level or came back to the level that they were playing at prior to? It hasn't been done. Now, besides the questions circling around Thomas, the Saints drafted wide receiver ready to play day one and Chris Olave while signing veterans Jarvis Landry. Now, Winston's health is going to be important here as Landry has always been a PPR type wide receiver, making his living underneath and ranking 20th in missed tackles force per reception and 21st in yards after the catch per reception. Now, Chris Olave has been a bit of a deep threat for the most part of his college career. Old Jameis, you know what? He ain't afraid to let it rip it. But hey, is this going to be game manager at Winston? I don't know. Next, for the Saints and the wide receivers, we have Marquez Callaway, Trey Quan Smith. Callaway, he led the Saints receiver core last season with 46 receptions, 84 targets, 15.2 yards per reception. Smith, well, he had 300 fewer receiving yards than Callaway, 698, while only being targeted on 50 occasions. Now, let's look at the tight end position here. Is Taysom Hill going to be that Saints tight end in 2022, or will he simply be a player with no designation? Now, if Hill is taking notes in that tight end room, he's going to be battling with Adam Troutman for snaps. Although, one would have to believe that even without Sean Payton in the fold, the Saints are going to have a separate playbook custom built for Taysom. Now, after Hill and Troutman, things get a little bit interesting. Nick Vanette and the big man, Jawan Johnson. I love myself some Jawan Johnson. Hey, I have a type, and I'm not afraid to admit it. Now, Jawan Johnson, he brings a lot more to the table than what Vanette brings and what he can offer. And we've seen Vanette long enough in the NFL to know what he's truly about. He's just another guy. The Saints defense, they are ready to roll here. They have a solid line with two top-end pass rushers here in Cameron Jordan and Marcus Davenport, who's probably going to miss a little bit of time off the top there of training camp. They have a formidable secondary with the additions of Tyron Matthew and Marcus May joining Marshawn Lattimore, Paul Sinadibo, and Chauncey Gardner-Johnson. The linebacker and core behind Demario Davis, there's a little bit of question there. As for now, Pete Warner, Zach Bond, they basically get themselves penciled in next to Davis. But watch for Eric Wilson and DeMarco Johnson to push for early season reps here, early on here in camp. Now let's look at the Buccaneers. Are they staying? Are they going? Tom Brady, he retired and unretired. Rob Gronkowski, he's retired and he's still retired right now. Probably trying to get that little bit of that, uh, well, I don't know what he's trying to get. Now, when you have Tom Brady under center, there is no competition. Forget about it. I don't care who you are. It's Tom Brady's team or nobody's team. Brady has led the NFL over the last two seasons in yards per game with 301.5, and that's likely not changing. This Bucks team, they feature one of the most pass-heavy teams, regardless of the score, trailing, tied, ahead. It doesn't matter. There you're going to throw the ball. That said, if something were to happen, 
the pass heavy script is going to change in a hurry with Blaine Gabbert being the next man up. Well, Kyle Trask, he tries to hold off Ryan Griffin is the QB three there. Now talk about the running back position. Playoff Lenny, he showed up late in that 2020 season and things have been going. The good times have been rolling ever since in Tampa Bay. There are very few every down backs these days. And Leonard Fournette, he is one of them. With 10 touchdowns last season on 180 carries, 69 more receptions on 84 targets, Fournette has proven to be the back in Tampa Bay. So the question is, who's number two? Well, let's forget about Keyshawn Vaughn. That was fun while it lasted, wasn't it? And focus on Gio Bernard and rookie Rashad White. Bernard will be afforded the early opportunities, but talent always wins out. The cream always rises to the top. Now, White, he led the rookie running back class in yards per route run at 2.7, and he ranks as the third best all-time in yards created database, Graham Barfield again, in yards per route run, behind only Joe Mixon, 2.9, and Alvin Kamara's 2.8. White, he's bigger, he's faster, and a better pass catcher than Bernard. So it's not going to take very long before Rashad White pretty much makes Bernard obsolete. Wide receiver position, no Antonio Brown this season, and the Bucs will be without Chris, Chris Godwin there for the early portion. Even when Godwin returns, there's going to be a period in which he's going to need to get himself right, a period of time for him to accustom himself to game speed. We know Godwin's yards and targets per game increased without Antonio Brown a lot. So who stands to benefit the most in Godwin's absence? How about Russell Gage? Handpicked by Tom Brady, Gage finished the 2021 campaign with the Falcons with 66 receptions on 94 targets, 770 yards. And essentially, hey, he's basically been what Robert Woods was going from Buffalo to LA. Maybe we're going to have a similar type of transition here for Russell Gage. Now, Evans will be Evans. You're going to get yourself a 1,000-yard season when the smoke's all said and done. And with Godwin's out, you can expect somewhat of an increased production there. Now, over the last two seasons here, there's been seven games in which Godwin played with uh, neither Antonio Brown or Chris Godwin was part of. Over those games there, when you look at it closely, Evans averaged 22.3 fantasy points per contest with his lowest fantasy production without Brown and Godwin coming in at 15.1 fantasy points. And like every other contest in this sample size, he would walk away with a touchdown. So you know Evans is good for 15 fantasy points. He's going to get himself a touchdown. It's going to happen. Don't even try and stop it. Now, a tight end. We know Gronkowski's gone right now, for now. It doesn't mean he's not going to be back at some point. So fantasy managers, what do we do? Can we count on Kate Otten here? Gronkowski, he finishes a tight end seven in fantasy points. Last year, tight end three in terms of fantasy points per game. Can either Cameron Brait or Kate Otten step up and get that role? We know Cameron Brait, he's going to get the very first opportunity to do this. But will he do anything with that opportunity? I don't think so. I don't see that happening. Neither one of these tight ends right now this season has much flavor for me, right? But Kate Otten is a guy for Dynasty you need to be able to get on your roster right now. Now, when we're talking about this Buccaneers defense, neither Jason Pierre-Paul, Nadama Kinsu have found a place to play yet in 2022. So there is an outside chance that, hey, they could come back to the Buccaneers. However, the Bucs, they did just sign Akeem Hicks recently, which may lead us to believe they have no interest in JPP or Sue at this time. And you know what? Sue, I think he's already looking on. He's talking Raiders and this stuff. Now, let's talk about what is there, though. With Hicks, the Bucs have themselves an absolutely dominating interior player when he is healthy, who is going to be able to come in there and mentor guys like Logan Hall right off the get-go. And he's going to fit in very nicely in a rotation with William Golston up front. Hicks, he can also provide that anchor in the middle, so you can slide him over there and spill Vita Via there for short periods of time. What you don't want to spill for short periods of time is that fantasy point subscription. Go in there, get that now, lock that in. Vipers 22 will get you 10% off that promo code today. So do that. Also, like, subscribe to this video on the Vipers Network on YouTube. It only takes a second. It helps me out a lot. And make sure to rate and view us, spread this out, retweet, whatever you got to do. We love you. Loving us. Let us help you. So we'll see you next time. Take care.